welcome to the debrief. This is your weekly catch up of everything happening in public policy and politics here in North Carolina. I'm Donna King. I'm editor in chief of the Carolina Journal. We've got our whole team here uh, talking about just two weeks to go before the election, maybe a little less actually. Uh, so we'll be watching it really closely. We have Jeff Moore, uh, CJ's deputy editor with lots of good analysis and CJ reporter Brianna Kramer with the latest on what's happening with the state legislature and passing uh, hurricane relief funds. And then of course, we have Mitch Kokai from the John Locke Foundation and Dr. Andy Jackson uh, from the Civitas Center for Public Integrity with the John Locke Foundation election expert. Andy, I'm gonna start with you because big news I feel like is really happening now as we have a lot more early voting happening in North Carolina. We do, and th this was a really unusual thing that happened. Actually, the first time it's happened where we've actually had more Republicans than Democrats uh, who have voted early. Uh, we still have another week and a half or so of early voting to go, but traditionally Democrats had started out of the gate strong on early voting, and then Republicans have outvoted Democrats on individual early voting days, mm -hmm. usually as we get closer to election day, but this is the first time where you've actually had Republicans in aggregate have more early votes and now also a combination of early and male votes than Democrats. So um, there's a lot of ins and outs with that and a lot of possibilities about what this means. But the bottom line is uh, you would much rather be the head of the Republican Party in North Carolina than the Democratic Party in North Carolina right now. Sure, sure. Well, is it an enthusiasm gap? What are you thinking? What, what you're thinking about this? You know, it's hard to tell because the the change is you've, you've got more Republicans going in and okay. there's been a concerted Republican effort. They had this bank your vote effort. Right. Uh, President Trump has kind of reversed his messaging uh, from 2020 and has been encouraging folks, uh, Republicans to vote early, his supporters mm -hmm. to vote early and by mail. Um, but you've also got about 70,000 fewer Democrats who have voted than at this point four years ago. So this combination of Republicans perhaps moving up or more Republicans, there are a few more Republicans, new Republicans than Democrats voting this time around, is combined with Democrats who normally by this time have come out and already voted are either holding back or maybe not voting at all. Very interesting. What are your thoughts on this? To me, the most interesting part about it okay. is the last thing that, that Andy mentioned about the lower number of Democrats. Okay. To me, the, the rise of the Republicans is a sign of a couple things. One, right. that Republicans after years and years are finally getting more comfortable with this idea of voting early and not voting on election day, okay. which will actually make it easier for people like sure. me who vote on election yeah. day. We won't <laughs> have long as long a line. But Republicans had traditionally been sort of uh, as as they are conservative, sure. saying, well, I don't want to do that. You're supposed to vote on election day. We're just going to wait until then. But the, the party and the activist groups working with the Republicans have said, no, we want to get as many of our people out there voting early as possible so we can focus our attention on the marginal voters who might not vote and get them to get out there on election day or at the end of early voting so we can get as many uh, sure. GOP votes as possible. So I think that is starting to have an impact. Uh, along with the fact that uh, you, you have had such a, a strong effort, uh, as Andy had already mentioned, among saying, look, regardless of what was said about 2020 elections, everything is secure, it's mm -hmm. safe, it's going to operate as it should in North Carolina, so don't be afraid to go out and vote early. So, so there's that, that, that sure. factor. But the bigger factor, I think, in this Republican surge is the fact that it's combined with the, the lower numbers of Democrats, because nothing right. has changed in terms of their approach. Right. They're approaching the election the same way they always had, get people out early, and if fewer of them are getting out early, that could be a sign of less enthusiasm. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, the reason the, for the Harris switch was not just problems with Joe Biden, it seems like there's an enthusiasm problem. And all, from everything we've seen, they thought that they had solved that. I guess they haven't, or what, what do you think? If Democrats are gonna show up, would it be on election day? I, it may be, yeah. but that would be a change and not one that would have been predicted. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not as if Democrats have come forward with this major plan saying, right. Now we're going to switch and we all want you to vote on Election Day. Sure. They've been approaching things, as far as I could tell, as they usually have. Right. Get the people out, have the souls to the polls when you could sure. vote, uh, and then and try to bank as many of their votes as early as possible. It's the, the change in terms of the approach has come on the Republican side. Right. So you would expect that uh, all other things being equal, Republican numbers would go up. 
and Democratic numbers would stay about the same, or if they had more enthusiasm, go up. For their numbers to be going down is not a right. strong sign for them. Interesting. And from the data you see, do you see a, um, any trends in terms of like who they are, where they live? How is early voting across the board, regardless of party? Well, regardless of party, the electorate compared to 2020, at this point, mm -hmm. things could change as more voters sure. come in, is it's slightly more male, mm -hmm. it's a little bit older, mm -hmm. uh, it's a little more white. Okay. Uh, so these are all kind of marginal changes from 2020 to 2024. All of those changes are in a direction that favors Republicans. Okay. Um, and so that's an encouraging thing. The other thing you have to remember is for that, them. Yes, yeah. Yeah, for <laughs> Republicans. Yeah, sure. Uh, is that Democrats are operating on a smaller pool of voters than they were four years ago. There's been about a 400,000 uh, registered voter shift. Democrats have dropped a couple hundred thousand. Republicans have picked up uh, a, a bit. And you know, unaffiliated, of course, has risen a lot. But there's a two problems with unaffiliated as far as Democrats are concerned. Uh, the single biggest one is that they are a lot less likely to vote. They always have lower turnout than either okay. Republicans or Democrats. So if you are uh, hitching your wagon to say, well, we're going to depend on these you know, unaffiliated voters, the, especially these younger unaffiliated voters, that's a bit of a dangerous game from okay. a turnout standpoint just because they are so unreliable compared to people that are registered with a party. And two, you can't depend on unaffiliated to vote your way even if they do show up. Uh, there was actually a very uh, slight tendency, I mean almost imperceptible, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, unaffiliated to vote for Trump back in 20. Right. Now obviously that can change. Uh, uh, disproportionately a lot of the unaffiliated, new unaffiliated voters are younger. They tend to be more democratic. Mm -hmm. And so they'll say, well maybe they'll switch, but is it going to switch to make up for that kind of 70,000 vote? Uh, drop off? Uh, probably not. Sure. Very interesting. Put this in context for me for the national stage. You know, North Carolina having a, a high turnout, particularly among Republicans, could mean big things nationally. Yeah, so uh, North Carolina voters are, are pretty powerful, mm -hmm. nationally ranked. We had a Wallet Hub uh, report that came out and then ranked them second in the nation as far as the most, second wow. most powerful voters uh, behind Nevada and then followed by Georgia in the Arizona and Wisconsin. So all swing states, and this all makes sense because the, the decision and the, the way that those states go is going to help determine how the presidential race goes. Uh, so nationally, that may take pressure off some of the campaigns or put more pressure mm -hmm. on the other campaigns. So if you look at North Carolina slipping away, if you're the Harrison Waltz campaign, sure. you see two weeks left and you see some of these turnout numbers, you may supercharge some of your your efforts there if you think it's still within reach. Sure. If you think it's slipping out of reach, it actually may change some of the the uh, calculus as far as where they spend time and some of the other swing states that may be more uh, more attainable for them. Uh, for the Republicans, uh, that's if you're the head of the Republican Party here in North Carolina now, uh, you're you're very very encouraged, obviously, and nationally uh, for mm -hmm. the Trump campaign, looking at the swing states, they're feeling better and better about their position in North Carolina. Uh, you start to wonder as an operator, and this is my first question: is when you see all these votes and the vote shares being uh, as high as they are between Republicans and Democrats, and then where the election day voting will actually fall because of that history of, of having a, more of an emphasis on election day. How much does early vote cannibalize election day voters? Right. And we can't really see that until we actually get to election day. So, sure. uh, so you're encouraged if you're a Republican uh, nationally looking at North Carolina. Uh, you may still be holding your breath a little bit to see how much that pulls from election day or not. Mm -hmm. And then uh, otherwise, the, the interesting comparisons to me between 2020 and 2024 right. is just the sheer number of absentee ballots we had in 20 and how we won't get even closer. I think sure. it's 93% that are voting in person so far in North right. Carolina mm -hmm. this year. Uh -huh. um, and so that's just a whole different ballgame than what we faced four years ago. So. Um, it's super interesting to have these streams cross and have Republicans have the highest share of the vote count in aggregate uh, at this point in the early voting cycle is definitely notable and something that people are going to pay attention to. It may be an inflection point in how, uh, how the voting patterns happen here in North Carolina going forward in cycles. Sure. Sure. What about for the state legislature? What could this mean uh, for them? I know that you know it's very, very tight right now, very narrow supermajority. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, there's uh, several key races we're watching around mm -hmm. the Charlotte area and Raleigh area and the suburbs, um, the toss-up races that could go either way. Sure. Um, so that remains to be seen. But something I wanted to add in is yeah, at the national level, um, the U.S. House and Senate are up for grabs and could go to 
either party's control. And so we're watching very closely um, on the House side, Congressional District 1, um, where Republican Lori Buckow is up against Representative Don Davis. And so that's a very interesting race, and to see the voter turnout there right now uh, shows that the GOP is definitely yeah, in the favor in that area. Um, they're up 12%, the uh, really, number of in voters District one. in District 1 coming wow. out to vote. And then the Democrat voters are down 33%. And then unaffiliated voters are right where they were in 2020. Sure. Um, so definitely a big swing uh, for both parties compared to 2020. And it's also interesting because the amount of ads and money going oh into gosh. this race are insane. Um, $15 million um, from the Democrat side has gone into ad buys in okay. District 1 and $8.5 million from the GOP. Wow. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually on the Democrat side, that's the most out of the whole country. So sure, sure. there's a lot of money being spent on that race and things are so far uh, looking more in the favor of the Republican Party. Wow, and Democrat Don Davis is the incumbent. He is mm -hmm. currently the, the one there, so that's, that's why right. we're focused on that one so closely. Mm -hmm. And that's just one out of 15 races in the whole country that are toss-up races for the wow. U.S. House. So, so it's going to come down deal. to just a few. Right, yeah, just a few races will determine if the U.S. House is Republican or Democrat and what's going to happen for the next couple of years. That is so interesting. And yeah. it's important to remember our current delegation mm -hmm. is seven Republicans and seven Democrats, but mm -hmm. the way the new election maps are spelled out, all but the race that Brianna was ta just talking about are pretty much decided because of the way the maps are spelled out. It looks as if there will be ten Republicans, three Democrats, and then that one Sure. Uh, race that could go either way, which means that in North Carolina, mm -hmm. Republicans are likely to make a gain of three or four seats, which could have a major impact when you get down to the brass tacks of who's going to end up in that with that bare majority in the House up in D.C. That's going to be a contentious year ahead for mm -hmm. sure, no question about it. Um, so one of the things I also wanted to do, if I can come back to you on the state um, on the state house and the state legislature, mm -hmm. Hurricane Helene, a big big uh, crisis they're dealing with right now. How are we going to rebuild those parts of Western North Carolina? Tell me what's happening this week. Yeah, so they just came out with their new Part Two disaster recovery package. Package okay. to fund uh, the Hurricane Helene relief efforts. So this new package is going to be $600 million. So the one they passed two weeks ago was about $270 million. Um, so this is a big increase from just a couple weeks ago, and it's going to fund a lot of different state departments that are then going to you know, distribute that money to different areas sure. and different needs out in western North Carolina. So uh, the Department of Environmental Quality, that's going to receive the most funds mm -hmm. at $139 million. Okay. Um, so really, they they need help with water and sewer infrastructure. Huge. So that's oh, like course. the huge, expensive thing that needs you know to run these these towns and get them back up and running. So mm -hmm. um, that is the most significant funding. And then we also have the Department of Public Safety for additional infrastructure needs. Uh, they're going to be receiving 130 million, and then DHHS as well, and the Department of Public Instruction. That's another sure. one where you know schools and their uh, buildings, infrastructure, and right. the equipment they use every day, all of that uh, that was damaged or destroyed. You know they need the funds to get these schools back up and running. I know they're still doing remote learning in some areas, and so right. um, all this money is hopefully going to help further along the process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this money are the the big majority is coming from the rainy day fund. So okay. they tell me a little bit about that because that's mm -hmm. something we've talked about a lot over the last decade. Is the rainy day fund that this Republican-led state legislature has been really building it up and saying, "Look, you, d you never know when it's going to come." Mm -hmm. so and and that day, gets. that yeah. day has come. And thankfully, they had way more than enough money in that account. That reserve has 4.75 billion dollars. Okay. And so in this bill, they're only using 600 million of it. Okay. So they still have a lot of money left in that account to use in additional packages if they decide to come back and pass even more mm -hmm. um, or for whatever rainy day comes next. Sure, but there's some conflict though between the state legislature and the governor's office. What happened? Yes, there there is ongoing conflict over where $175 million went. Uh -huh. um, uh, but they're requesting from the governor's uh, executive branch, they're requesting $175 million more. They say that, you know, they already used up their budget. Um, and this is the 
the bureaucracy, the the management, the actual salaries and functioning of the ORR, right? Mm -hmm, that's of right. Resilience and recovery, or recovery and resilience. Mm -hmm, that's that's right. So. Okay. Yeah, they, they apparently need more money, and this was just found out mm -hmm. recently by the General Assembly, um, and they're just calling it uh, financial disaster mismanagement by mm -hmm. Governor Cooper. Um, where did this money go? And now you're coming to us asking for additional money, um, and so they're putting a lot of the blame on Cooper for this. Very interesting. What are your thoughts on this? The, the controversy is never in the willingness to actually pass the aid packages. Right. Uh, it usually comes after in the quickness or the, the slowness that that money actually moves out to the areas sure. where it needs. We're still dea dealing with issues from Hurricane Matthew, mm -hmm. Hurricane Florence. And 16, 2016, 2018. Yeah, these yeah. years are going on uh, almost a decade ago now. So uh, with, with this package 2.0 for Helene, mm -hmm. Um, the, the questions go to what the, the further needs are going to be, and this is going to be layered like a cake here sure. for the next several months probably as they figure out what the true needs are, mm -hmm. but how quickly those resources actually get to where they need to be and right. then how those resources are able to deploy right. and get water systems back in line and all these kind of things in order. Um, so. Uh, with with Cooper's office and the controversy there about the money, that the the financial mismanagement is something um, that uh, seems to go back a long way too. Mm -hmm. Especially, and we've talked about this with COVID funds as they came sure. into the state, and there seems to be this giant question mark, this mystery about like what actually happens to a lot of these funds. Sure, and we're finding out that some of those questions remain in some of our state offices yeah. here, uh, controlled by the governor. So it's never a good time to find out you're missing $175 million when you're passing emergency relief packages for something like Helene sure. in Western North Carolina. Uh, but at least now they've got the spotlight on it, and you've got more pressure on Cooper to do a better job of communicating how they're actually uh, mm -hmm. operating with these disaster funds and how they're getting them out. Sure. Uh, so hopefully they can actually reconcile, figure out how this happened, and, and put some uh, some barriers in place to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Right, right. This this ORR, something we've been talking about in Carolina Journal for, for quite a while. Um, there are still, you know, a lot of people from 2016, 2018, Matthew and Florence, still without permanent housing. People were in hotels still from 2016 to 2023. That is not promising for our Western North Carolina neighbors. And, and as they go into uh, allocating 600, another $600 million, I would hope that they want some answers, right? Right, and you know that's a part of the state where you expect hurricanes. Hurricanes sure. happen not all the time, but often right. enough that people need to say, okay, it's another hurricane, let's do what we do during yeah. hurricanes and do it well and do it better than we've done before. It doesn't look as if the Cooper administration has done as well as it could. Uh, to me, the most interesting piece about this was right after Helene, you saw pretty much unanimity sure. among the elected leaders. Yeah. Let's let's work together, let's get things right. done. The first Helene package passes unanimously. Cooper signs it the next day. Really only two weeks later, Who's you start getting that? into yeah. the, the, the politics mm -hmm. of it. Cooper comes out with this plan for, we need $4 billion basically to, to deal with Helene. And on the same day, uh, leading senators put out the release saying, wait a minute, uh, while you're asking for this, you're also asking for $175 million to deal with these other storms that we just heard about for the first time didn't come up during the last budget process. You're not waiting until the next budget process. Sure. You're tying it all to the, the people's desire to help folks with Helene. Right. And so I, I think the unanimity is, is dissipating, yeah. and it'll be interesting to see this package probably passes overwhelmingly, either unanimously or fairly close to it. Mm -hmm. But as we get further and further from the actual disaster and emergency itself, and you see more requests for money, that it's not exactly clear where it's gonna go or why, mm -hmm. that there, there will be a lot more questions being asked. And it's important, as we're dealing with Helene, to think about these past emergencies sure. and the state taking steps that have been somewhat questionable sure. or not very transparent. Yet, mm -hmm. well, we gave you this money, what'd you do with it? Why are people still living in hotels? Yeah. I think that's something that the Cooper administration and whoever takes over as the next governor is really going to have to think about. Sure, mm -hmm. particularly with all the frustration with FEMA and federal yeah. response, right? Yeah, I don't think anybody believes that this is going to be the last or even anywhere near the last package that's sure. going to come out of this. But you do have to as make assessments about what the actual needs are and how you're going to get them to the folks that need it. Sure. Um, I, I was just out there in Western North Carolina exactly. uh, recently, and there is definitely a real need. I mean 
up and down, you know, every county. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some places that, that we've all seen the footage of that are especially, uh, essentially destroyed. Right. Um, but there are other areas that have kind of, I hate to say low grade, but this kind of normal amount of where, okay, there's sure. a lane out on this road. If you're trying to go from this town to this town, we've got to fix that. Sure. There's a whole lot of that that has just been pushed down on the priority scale because you're dealing with these these real emergencies yeah. that are going on at the same time. Um, but you have, you know, you have to pay for all of that, and you have to figure out what is actually needed. Um, I'll give an example. One example, as I saw, and and the state board of elections provided a generator for this mm -hmm. early voting site. It hasn't been used yet because they got the power back on. Now these are very fluid situations, sure. and there's no way that they could have known for sure that they were going to have power when early voting started. But there's going to have to be boots on the ground from state officials, and probably you know not just relying on folks from the executive branch telling legislators what the need are, they're probably going to have to have their own assessment, especially those representatives and senators in the districts mm -hmm. out there, to say, well, this is what we actually need and this is what the priority of those things should be. Right. And, and remember, one of the challenges out there is, and Andy alluded to this, there are some parts of Western North Carolina that are, though they dealt with damage, still in fairly good shape and are trying to get visitors to come in because mm -hmm. this is their business. Right. This, this is how they contribute to the economy and to the mm -hmm. tax fund is to have visitors come in. You're having those folks trying to get the business while there are others saying, stay away. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we can't even get into our homes. We need only emergency responders here. That's going to be a big complication. And I think that will have an impact not only on the, the recovery effort, but it's also going to have future tax sure. impacts because Western North Carolina is not going to be contributing to the tax base in the year and probably the next right. couple of years ahead as it has in the past because they have had much of their economy just ripped out. Sure, sure. There's a great map on visitnc.com where you can see where can I visit, how can I contribute to the economy there, I've got a fall trip planned, go to the green areas, not the red. It's a really good map if you get a chance to look at it. You were just there. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on Western North Carolina's access to these polling places? Generally, they're good. Um, okay, good. The, we had places, I'll give you a couple of examples. I was in Hot Springs, which is almost on the Tennessee border. Um, and the original location was in downtown Hot Springs, which I learned from my trip there is the only place where people walk in the Appalachian Trail, walk through a downtown. The trail actually oh, goes really? right through the middle of town. Huh. Uh, they don't have a choice there because you got to cross the bridge <laughs> over the French Broad River. Right. Um, but unfortunately, uh, that original location in downtown Hot Springs was on a peninsula between the French Broad River okay. and a stream. And between the two of those, they had five feet of water. Wow. And so like all the buildings downtown, they're, they're unusable at this point. So they had to relocate to a, uh, a senior citizen uh, feeding location mm -hmm. uh, that's uphill a little bit. Okay. And so they got that open. Uh, they got the generator there, which it turned out they didn't need it, but they're up and running. Um, there's, I'll give another example. There's a election day polling place in Yancey County that mm -hmm. uh, the executive director talked about, I think it was in Ramsey Town. Um, the polling place is wiped out and the flooding from the river basically cut the precinct in two, and their response is, they got enough volunteers, they're gonna open two polling places on election day uh, to handle folks on both sides of the river there. And so, from a logistical standpoint, from what I saw, I visited uh, Yancey and Madison County, mm -hmm. two of the hardest hit counties there. Um, from the election administration part of things, they can handle it. The, the big issue is going to be on the side of voters. Can they physically get to a voting right. place? Uh, if they're displaced, can they get their ballot? Because you're allowed to turn it in anywhere in the state, essentially, mm -hmm. at this point. So if you're moving in with your cousin down in Winston-Salem, you sure. can turn it into the Forsyth County Board of Elections or an early voting site there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's going to be the issue. So far, turnout is a little bit down, about 4% in okay. the most affected counties. Um, but it's not down a lot, and I think that as people kind of get through their hierarchy of needs, sure. uh, I do expect turnout is going to get up somewhere close to normal out there. Good. That is really encouraging. I know that was a huge concern. Um, as we're going through this list, actually, we're going to wrap it up here. I want to get a few updates on some COVID-era lawsuits. Again, I thought it would be a bigger deal right now in the election. Not as much. 
But tell no, me what you think. Not really, but the interesting thing is the state Supreme Court held oral arguments this week, and on two days, Tuesday and Wednesday, they heard eight cases, all of which had to deal with COVID. Okay. A couple of them were companies that uh, were complaining because their insurance uh, insurance providers wouldn't cover damages from COVID. One was a case where there was a, a medical malpractice claim and the uh, physicians involved were trying to say that, oh, we, we should be immune because this took place during COVID and we mm -hmm. have protection. So the, those were, uh, from a public policy perspective, not as interesting, but the real biggies that are on the state Supreme Court's uh, docket this week were two cases dealing with fees at the University of North Carolina right. related to both the spring 2020 semester when everything shut down and then the fall 2020 semester when everyone was back at school except the two flagship campuses, mm -hmm. UNC Chapel Hill and NC State. So plaintiffs are trying to get money back for things that they never got. Sure, because, tickets. Right, tickets. Uh, safety, you, yeah. you, the health service, well, sure. if I'm at home in Waynesville, I wasn't using the Chapel Hill health right. service. So they're trying to get the, 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 the refunds, and so the state Supreme Court will decide whether those cases can go forward. There were two other cases about shutdowns of bars. Mm -hmm. You'll remember that bars were among all the businesses that got shut down, and as other businesses were allowed to reopen, private bars had to stay closed, right. even as bars and restaurants and country clubs and mm -hmm. breweries all reopened. And so they're suing to try to get money from the state for the forced closings there. Those were big. And then probably one of the most interesting cases and one that's been a, kind of a real talker is that in 2021, his high school football player gets notified from his school that he was uh, probably uh, in, a, in a COVID cluster. And if mm -hmm. he wanted to take part in his football team again, he'd have to go get a COVID test goes to a site gets to get a test. They're also doing the COVID vaccine mm -hmm. at this site and the, the kid doesn't want a vaccine. No one contacts his mom and some clinic worker just says, oh, give it to him anyway. So they gave him the Pfizer vaccine against mm -hmm. his will and without parental consent. He sued yeah. both the Guilford County School System and the North, Old North State Medical Society. And so far he has lost, he and his mom have lost their suit because of this federal PrEP Act mm -hmm. that gave immunity to those involved in dealing with the COVID pandemic. And so the issue is, does this PrEP Act really immunize these groups when someone says, nah, just give them the, give them the COVID vaccine? Right. Uh, both Chief Justice Paul Newby and Justice Trey Allen were, were fairly clear that they were dubious that the mm -hmm. PrEP Act actually provides immunity in those cases. So it'll be very interesting to see how that one plays out. Sure. But back to your initial question, despite this fact that these are all in front of the state Supreme Court, it doesn't really seem that COVID's having much of an impact on the right. election. You don't really hear people talking about sure. COVID policy. Yeah, I'm still angry. Yeah. <laughs> they <laughs> shut down schools and you know all of it. Um, but you know, it doesn't seem to be uh, impacting it. Certainly, you can find all of these stories, analysis, deep dives on um, on these cases. And then, of course, if you go to johnlock.org, you can find all of Andy's analysis there and carolinajournal.com. We're also going to be covering uh, election night live here on YouTube. So please join us for all of that. We've got all of the information that you need going into the next uh, few weeks of the election. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.